you have to have the fancy car and the big job and the fancy suit and all this and and the alpha male and then you get the girl and you get all this cash and prizes and I think that's a, a massive lie to young men. In fact, I'll just say this, there's a, something called the Grand Study. They tracked Harvard graduates in the 50s for their whole life. And at the end, they tried to figure out what makes happiness. And they said, the most important thing after everything's washed away is our relationships. That's the only sustaining thing of value in life. I lost my dad uh, just over a year ago, quite unexpectedly, and um, I kind of, in response, uh, self self destructed. I just couldn't function. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't even watch the TV um, because everything um, I felt was <clears throat> going to trigger me into another panic attack. Um, and what's so insidious about anxiety is that when it's experienced on that level. Um, it often becomes the fear of the fear um, that replaces any rational um, worry. And so I was just kind of um, at the mercy of, you know, my own head, my own terror. And my dad was um, in intensive care, which was somewhere he visited pretty regularly. Um, in the last, you know, in the last years of his life, and it kind of was touch and go, and I didn't know, uh, we didn't know whether he was going to pull through, and uh, you know, he was in, he was in a real state, and uh, just kind of seeing him so uh, broken down, um, yeah, that was that was tough. It's funny when you have. A difficult relationship with someone who you love a lot because when when things get serious, um, you know all of the all of the issues and the elephants in the room just kind of disappear, and you just love them, and you just don't want them to you don't want to lose them, and um, yeah, I sort of feel yeah I feel lucky that you know through all the stuff um, you know I didn't I didn't stop loving him you know then. Or, now. I remember once there was a party when I was a kid. There were loads of kids uh, who came over to my house. Uh, and my father at that time would, was telling us all off because we were signing to each other. And he would say, no, you can't sign to each other. You can't sign. And we were just looking at him. And I was really embarrassed in front of my friends. And who would you say you have a best relationship with, your mother or your father? Oh, um, I think normally, I'd say normally my mum. Uh, she was a bit more understanding. And what was the relationship like with your dad? I think both of us being guys, I think we were different people. Um, as a child, I didn't really like him, to be honest. He was really strict. I think uh, after he passed away, uh, December 2016, I started to see him in quite a different light. Every time uh, school broke up, 
uh, we'd all head off and we'd, we'd do some like really nice long walks. Like as a kid, I hated it. I really didn't want to do it. Um, and I just thought it was really boring and I'd just kind of like throw myself on the floor and be like, what? Get up, get up, come on, we're going, we're going for a walk. I'd be sat there being like, oh. And you know, I was awful as a kid. He worked really hard for our family. He made sure that, you know, we were provided for, and I, like, we had that communication barrier, um, which stopped us performing, uh, performing a, a, a proper relationship, but he was a good man at heart. I think I, I kind of started falling in love with that walking myself, and I realized, you know, maybe it's in the genes. Maybe that's part of him that he's passed on to me. Uh, mm. And it's a, it's a passion that, you know, I'm, I'm only just realizing and opening my eyes to now. I want to play for England, I want to do this, I want to be the best in the country. You get to that point and it's almost a blur and then suddenly you're like, okay, this is it. And it felt great, but I had such a, a bad injury which took me out for like six months. I didn't probably address the mental side of it because straight away from my injury, I thought to myself, physically, get better, get right. The toughest time in that period was the feeling of being alone. And it was a bizarre feeling because I had people around me, but I still felt alone. Yeah, we'll just get this. I think not only being a sportsman do you feel like you can't show your emotions, but also like as a man, toughen up, harden up, just get on with it, you know? And I, I guess throughout my whole life, what I did was I suppressed a lot of feelings and just got on with life. Up until I was 20, from, from a kid up until then, never any issues and, and happy. And then, you know, I, I entered into a profession where there's scrutiny, there's, there's judgment, there's all sorts of things. And perhaps, you know, I didn't have a father that led me through life. And then I was also dealing with that on my own. So I'm now learning all these lessons on my own. And who do I turn to? What do I ask? I lived in a council house. I was on the fifth floor of the estate and I ran down all the five flights and I met him at the bottom and I was, you know, as I was at the time, I would have been very emotional, as it were. Um, and I, I, it's such a vivid memory of me as a child, and it's something I've had to go back to several times to, like, overcome that feeling so it doesn't dictate my, my future feelings. What do you use to escape? What do I use to escape is uh, I've, I've navigated my way through life so far to, like, find better and me more meaningful ways to escape as opposed to maybe a painkiller, maybe just, you know, having a drink or whatever it might be. You have to learn these things and you get looked at and viewed at as a certain way, but, you know, I'm just a man trying to f find my way through life, you know. Boys should be able to cry because we have feelings. What kind of feelings? Um, emotional feelings. Um, we, that's it. Um, what do you do with your dad? Um, I haven't seen him. Um, I've only seen him once. Oh, when did you see him? Uh, a couple of days ago. For the first time? Oh, wow. What did you talk about, or what did he say to you? He said, hello, how have you been? Um, and then he took me back outside to my mum. And um, what did you think when you saw him? I'm happy. And how do you know why you haven't seen him until now? Because he's working. And he has to travel to different countries. Do you know when you're going to see him?
here we go. Mm. No. Towards the end, it was a, a, a bad marriage, and I think certainly my mom wanted to get out of that marriage, so I, there was a lot of drama, and it's quite vague, but there was fighting, and I just remember, this is 1980 now, a long time ago, but, but I didn't quite, I was only five, I didn't quite register it, but my father still showed up on the weekends and on Wednesdays, so it wasn't like my dad was gone, he was still very much a part of my life, but I guess things just settled a bit because they weren't fighting as much. So that's one thing maybe I remember. I know he loves me and always did, but I don't think he had any guidance in terms of how to be a suitable husband or father. And, and so he did his best, as we all try to do, but so I think that's where he fell down. When I think of my dad, he didn't give me hardly any guidance to navigate a, the adult world. And without with not having that guidance do how do you think that affected you growing up someone said yeah you're going to be five to ten years late on everything because you don't have a model i started a business in college then i worked on in hollywood then i had an internet idea then i w moved to new york and worked on wall street but then i left that and then i started a dating business that was my first real success teaching guys how to chat up girls and then over here i've had an educational business a podcast a real estate firm and it's like, these are all good ideas, but one thing I've missed is like, as soon as I got, have gotten bored or things have gotten difficult, some other shiny thing has caught my attention. I bought into it and I still can. I mean, there's a part of me when I watch Mad Men or this stuff like the alpha male, you know, drinking the whiskey, smashing it, getting the girl. There's a part of me that's the man, you know, I, I have conflict about that too. I, even though I have said all that, I can still get seduced by that image. What would you say from your experience being a an, 40-year-old an man now, what would you say with hindsight? Relationships are the, the fountain of joy. All, all the value in my life comes from the relationships I have with people, and those are not at all dependent upon assets or bling or fancy stuff. So learning how to communicate with other human beings and understand is probably the biggest skill I'd tell young people because that's enduring and can last till you're 85, 90. The other stuff comes and goes and is of inconsequential importance. I mean, provided you can, you know, have a roof over your head. Well, I taught them, we taught them, my mum and I, that when you're with grandpa and grandma or at school, you don't swear. And so they didn't. But at home, they did tell each other to fuck off and, um, because that was, I'm not saying it's good or bad. It's just, it's just how it was. It was very loose. I'm a good musician, a good partner, um, lousy dad, uh, got some sadness around how that was. Um, my addiction to alcohol made me a hit and miss dad. You know, I loved my kids and uh, was always fun to be around and supportive of them, but I wasn't a constant father. Uh, many years ago, living on the street, about 40 years ago, um, and lost and uh, strung out in California and the idea of just quitting it, uh, jacking it in, would, would pop up from time to time. And what prevented me from doing that was the fact that I had children on the planet. Mm. My youngest son was born uh, with a blood condition. I was told by the pediatrician that um, he had to have his blood changed completely. So, the, the, and he said, but it might kill him. Uh, the, the shock of doing that at, at just a few days old. And I said, well, so if we don't do that, what happens? He said, well, he'll be a vegetable by the time he's about four. 
just kind of drooling. So I said, well, let's do it. So my wife and I stayed in the hospital around the clock, sleeping in a broom cupboard, actually. Um, he wasn't eating. Uh, my experience was we'd been treating him not as a person, but as a medical condition. That, he'd, that he had got lost in, in this. So I went and uh, got some milk out of the fridge and warmed it up and got him out of his thing. And I spoke to him and I said, uh, look, you've had a really rough passage coming in here. If you want to go home, that's OK. But if you want to stay here, you have to suck on this. This is how it works. And he just reached. Uh, and then he wanted another one. Uh, he's now 37 and six foot two. Uh, that, that was an extremely emotional uh, event. Daniel choosing life. It's another thing that I've realised is completely lacking in our education when we're growing up. As to why, I don't know. I don't think it's helpful that we're left to be slapped in the face by these experiences. You know, I think it's very human to be really freaked out by that um, and to expect a lot more from yourself and your life than, um, you know, than is healthy in a way.